It's almost time to vote. And if you care about climate change, we can help you decide who to vote for. We've spoken to some major political parties about what they plan to do about climate change, if they do well in their elections. Here's what they have to say. The ANC has taken climate change seriously over the past 30 years. And under the leadership of the ANC government, we have signed the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. We've signed the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement. And in 2023, we submitted the revised nationally determined contribution with ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to build a climate resilient and inclusive society and economy. It's a fact that 200 years of industrialization uh, by the advanced countries has caused climate change. Africa's cumulative contribution to climate change is 2% of global emissions. So what we're doing at the moment is interviewing representatives of political parties on, on what their position is. What is the vision? Um, what is the implementation plan? So that's really what I'd like to cover in, in the next 25 minutes or so, if you're comfortable with that. Sure. I mean, I think, um, did you did, did you listen to the debate the other day? The SAFM? The WWF debate. Yeah, it was very okay. useful. Yeah. You want to take it down okay. to a slightly more... Um, a slightly less less sort of jargonistic policy conversation um, and look at how policies on climate change affect particularly communities that are going through uncertainty, um, Pumalanga communities, for example, but also just sort of what the ANC's vision is in terms of whether and how climate change can be a, a catalyst in terms of different kinds of jobs, different kind of economic development, etc. So, so that's really the, the the framing that we're applying to this. So, just to kick off, if I if I look at the various political parties' election manifestos, the the NC's manifestos were one of the most one of the best thought through um, in terms of practical solutions and implementation, etc. But there is still a feeling that although the policy thinking is is good and it's progressive and it is geared towards a just transition, that the implementation is the problem. Whether it's accessing international financing, dealing with um, coal powered power stations, et cetera. Do you mind just sort of describing how the ANC sees climate change as an issue? Okay. So I think that it's difficult to answer that question without looking at the role the ANC has played in, com in, in combating climate change over the last 30 years. Because I think that where we are in the manifesto, the manifesto really talks a lot about the economic opportunities around the green transition and very much um, would, would speak to the, the issues in the first point that, that you raise. But I think what's what's important to note is that the ANC has taken climate change seriously over the past 30 years. And under the leadership of the ANC government, we have signed the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. We've signed the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement. And in 2023, we submitted the revised nationally determined contribution with ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to build a climate resilient and inclusive society and economy. Now, I'm emphasizing this latter point because very often um, when people in, in talk about the nationally determined contribution, they're only referring to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But South Africa has submitted what we call a comprehensive NDC that looks at both mitigation and adaptation. And um, I think it's also important to say that over the last five years, 
we have put in place as an ANC-led government the substantial architecture to combat, to deal with mitigation, um, but also to deal with adaptation, beginning as far back as 2020 with the National Adaptation Strategy. And one of the things you would understand that makes climate change adaptation so complicated in our country is that South Africa is one of the mega biodiverse countries in the world. And what that means is that we have a mega range of climate change impacts. So in the western half of the country, we are dealing with drought and um, related to drought, heat waves, um, increasing wildfires. And on the eastern side of the country, we are dealing with floods, storm surges, and extreme storms. Um, with winds, hail, you know, situations where in the course of one night one is one is experiencing almost a year's worth of of rain, like we had um, back in in April 2022. So I think that's very that's very important. And if you you look at at the strategies that that are in development. We're also talking about the impacts of climate change on people, on infrastructure, on food, and on water security, because we recognize that these are going to be the, the main areas. So we've had to, to work with every district municipality in the country to develop a, an individualized climate change adaptation strategy. And the idea, once the climate bill becomes law is that these strategies will then have to find their way into the mainstream of government planning processes and government budgeting. Recently, I think it was last week, I published the ninth greenhouse gas inventory. And um, what that um, inventory indicated is that we greenhouse gas emissions have peaked in our country and they're now on the decline. Uh, we are currently within the range of our 2024 targets. And I don't know if I need to go, Chris, do you want me to go into what, what those targets are? Or I, yeah. I, you know, that, that would be very helpful. Range. That, okay. Be, don't mind. All right. So the NDC, which we published, which was for um, 2025 and 2030, has a range. The top of the range is compatible with the, the two degree average temperature increase. And the bottom of the range is compatible with the average increase of 1.5 degrees that science tells us is preferable to an average temperature increase of two degrees. And that is because what science is telling us is that if we can hold average temperature increase to 1.5, extreme weather um, conditions will be less severe than they will be at two degrees. So we are below the two degrees, but we are we we are, we would have to do a lot more work and we need a lot more money in order to to be able to reduce emissions to the 1.5 degree mark by either 2025 or 2030. Now, I think it's also important to say that government's approach to the climate transition aims to balance environmental sustainability with economic development and social equity. So as we reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build resilience and adaptive capacity, we aim to do so in a manner that doesn't leave vulnerable workers and vulnerable communities behind. Well, the jobs is an issue that comes up again and again, uh, which you just referred to. I mean, I, I, I interviewed someone from the DA this morning um, who's quite blasé about the fact that if people lose their jobs in Mpumalanga as a result of power stations closing down or coal mines, we shouldn't worry because new jobs are being created in the Western Cape. Um, I, I, pulled, <laughs> I had the same response as you. And I, mean, and I mean, you know, they're really keen on people from the Eastern Cape moving into yes, the Western Cape. Imagine exactly. how keen they get to be on people from Mpumalanga immigrating yeah. to the Eastern Cape. 
but 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 it did it did raise in my mind the fact that that some of these conversations feel quite abstract and and you're speaking about plans that are being developed at municipal level in terms of adaptation and mitigation do you mind talking through how an example of that would work how a particular municipality you don't need to name it but how it's how it's looking at these issues in a more practical a practical way you see, Chris, this is where we get into difficulty, because if you're going to quote this as the ANSI manifesto, then uh, that wouldn't be accurate. So I think that that's a, that's a very important statement because it talks directly um, in the manifesto to those communities. And I think what it, what it, what, what is important is to unpack in the context of this quote, our conceptualization of climate justice. Because I, I began um, and I said to you that our parties plan to tackle the, trans, the necessary transition away from fossil fuels is grounded in a commitment to sustainability, innovation and social equity. So by implementing our, our climate change policies, we are quite focused in the manifesto, not just on the risks that climate change poses to our country, but on the opportunities that climate change poses in terms of developing new sectors of the economy. And there's, it, it, in the manifesto, we talk about um, de developing new forms of energy, to promote energy security. Uh, we talk about supporting innovation and research and development in green technologies. We talk about prioritizing the development of green technology in areas such as energy efficiency, waste management, climate smart agriculture, infrastructure, green hydrogen, battery storage, and electric vehicles. And we talk about mitigating and adapting to the effects of climate change in a manner that supports vulnerable communities. And I think that that um, it's important to frame the Mpumalanga discussion in terms of new economic opportunities, not just in the Northern Cape or the Eastern Cape where there's a lot of wind, but in Mpumalanga itself. And I think that the commitment that um, the current ANC government has made in adopting the Just Transition Framework, Cabinet adopted the Just Transition Framework of the Climate Commission, is that new, new industries are going to require new forms of skilling and reskilling of existing workers, but they're also going to require skilling of a whole range of young people who are currently outside of the economic situation um, so that they can enter these new industries. Now, I think it's quite interesting here, the manifesto doesn't talk about Komati Power Station, but it's quite interesting to look at Komati Power Station as an example of not a good ex not a good guinea pig model and to look at what's happening there now to try and put the situation right and as i say this is not in the anc's election manifesto but it's but it's work that is being driven by escom uh, the climate commission and a whole range of civil society organizations who are now sitting down with the community and saying, first of all, how do we front load um, social relief options? Because what went wrong in the in the Kamati situation was that while the, the workers who were directly employed in the power station were given other economic opportunities in other power stations. What the, the process didn't look at was the whole ecosystem in Kamati that was completely dependent on that power station. So, so the first thing that, that um, is being worked on is how do we front load um, a socioeconomic safety net? 
Um, and there's various um, EPWP uh, programs that are in um, an advanced stage of development and financing that um, are aimed at uh, providing social relief to about 300 people in the area. There's also a, a much longer planning that is now taking place with ESCOM, with the Ekangala um, municipal municipality and with a range of civil society organizations to say what are the different forms of economic opportunity that can be developed there. ESCOM itself is repurposing the power station. They want to um, produce microgrids in, in Komati. Um, there's also talk about producing other forms of battery storage there. But there, there's also discussion on trying to use this transition for overall community development. So the development of um, ECD for early childhood development centers, um, a permanent clinic, because at the moment there's only a mobile clinic in the area. So there's there's a lot of attention. You know, the, the just transition framework that was adopted um, by the ANC-led uh, government really talks about three forms of justice. The first form they're saying is that those directly affected must be part of planning the alternatives. The second is that those directly affected must share in the benefits and not just in the risks. And the third area is that overall, when we reach the end of the process, the community as a whole has to be better off and more developed than it was before the repurposing and the repowering started. So I don't know whether that, um, I've given you a bit of a mishmash between a, an actual example, but also some of the things that are in the manifesto. And I don't know whether that helps answer the question that you were posing. It does. I mean, it, it does also, I mean, my my response when I read the manifesto was with, there's a reinforcement in it of the fact that this is an opportunity. It's an unfortunate opportunity. And a lot of the discussion is is almost about about global warming in particular and carbon emissions is quite apocalyptic, but mm. but what the ANC has been able to do alongside other others obviously is look at what the opportunities are that this presents. W would you agree mm. with? That? Yes, I think that that is very much what what um, our approach to the transition is is that. When we talk about um, transitioning at a, at a pace and speed South Africa can afford that leaves no one behind, what, what we're meaning is that not only do we have to make sure that direct workers and indirect workers benefit, but that it's got to help us with our overall program of fighting poverty, inequality, and unemployment and growing the, the size of the economic pie. I think the the big problem of economic exclusion in our country is that the economy is too small. And, you know, we're not just talking about jobs here. Obviously, jobs are important, but we're also talking about new economic owners and new forms of ownership. And I think that that's a very important part of the conceptualization because we don't just want existing owners. Um, we don't just want a situation where, well, ESCOM always ran power stations, now it runs renewable power stations. Um, and, you know, some of what's interesting about what's in, in the manifesto, for example, is, is this thing where they talk about increasing the number of, of houses that have access to solar water geysers and um, doing this so that we support job creation and local manufacture. So I think that there's there's a recognition that um, there's lots of new forms of employment and ownership that are that are already being created through the transition um, to different forms of of renewables. Um, there's a huge, you know, there's there's just this huge industry of putting up solar panels at the moment, um, and another huge industry of 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 implementing solar water geysers. But we're saying that in addition to that, in places like Komati, we've got to start looking at which aspects of the components of those things can we manufacture locally. Even if it's just 
friends. Um, mm. There must be there must be that local input, um, but also ways in which poor households or, or households living in conditions of poverty can benefit from renewable energy. Because at the moment, the, the you know when when uh, the cap was lifted on embedded generation and all all the restrictions were were lifted on on um, private installation of renewables, it's by and large middle class people that are benefiting from that. And obviously, um, the benefit to to having solar panels and 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 um, solar geysers is that it substantially renew, reduces the cost of electricity for a household. So um, I think these are these are things that we would want to ensure are not just available for the middle class, but we find packages and 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 creative ways in which we can make them available to working class households. That's, that's very helpful. The, the the elephant in the room often is is global finance. Um, mm. I've spoken uh, about the you know how a lot of this transition is going to be funded. What is what does the manifesto say? What is the ANC's view on on global funding? Are there any? Th th is it going to involve compromises? Are there any areas that you're concerned about in terms of strings being attached or? things that we're not aware of right now? I don't think that um, the ANC likes strings attached. Um, I think that that our position has always been in the international climate negotiations is that developed countries are responsible for climate change. And, you know, the major climate injustice is that the victims of climate change are by and large poor people living in developing countries who very often have no climate carbon footprint at all. Mm. Um, but but you know, you just think about what's going on in Mozambique um with with all of these tropical cyclones that are are hitting the area, Mozambique, Malawi, and so on. Um, hitting communities that really have a minuscule carbon footprint. And I, I think that what we are very clear um, and, and our manifesto says is that we will work in the international space to attract climate finance to support South Africa and Africa's just transition, climate adaptation, support for loss and damage, and for, for the risks posed by extreme weather events. And and I don't think that that we we don't we regard that as an obligation and a duty by developed countries uh because they are responsible for the climate crisis yeah i, uh, I don't want to put words in your yeah. mouth but in a sense it's a form of reparation for past activity well uh that's a you know as somebody who's been uh, been involved for five years in the negotiations that's a that's a thorny issue in the in the negotiations because the developed countries always say that um, we will give this, that, and the next thing, but it's not an admission that we've caused climate change and it's not reparations. And I suppose uh, the reason is because once you start to give reparations, somebody's going to say, well, actually, let's evaluate how much damage you have done and what it's really going to cost. So, you know, when they set up the loss and damage fund, um, in Dubai, they were they were very quick to to say that. But um, you know, whatever we call them, it's a fact that two hundred years of industrialization uh, by the advanced countries has caused climate change. Africa's cumulative contribution to climate change is two percent of global emissions. So <laughs> South Africa would probably be responsible for half of those. Um, because because together with Nigeria and and Egypt, we would be probably the most carbon intensive economies yeah, on the continent. That's very helpful and very encouraging. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for your time and all the best, really. It's been great. Well, you know, um, one of the things that's been so interesting for me about this term, and I said this to my senior managers when we had our last management meeting last week, 
I said to them that, you know, they, I, I, I have found a new course. Um, and uh, even if I'm just a granny against climate change, I know what I'm going to be doing. 